Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces out there. So um, I, uh, well, Randall already introduced, introduced me, but I also wanted to introduce Gabriella Meza, where she, she's my co-chair for Team Spirit this year. And um, if you can believe, this is gonna be our 25th year. I know, right? Right? Um, so how many of you have participated in Team Spirit at least once? Show of hands. Nice. It's a great day, isn't it? It's so much fun. Morning walk on the beach, right? And um, now you get the opportunity to join us again <laughs> for our 25th anniversary. And we um, are going to be doing that on Saturday, October 26th. So mark your calendars. You can spend that morning walking, celebrating, and um, just really being a community together. And so where does the money go that we raise? So Renee kind of rattled off a list of supportive services. That's where Team Spirit money goes. It supports our mentor program, which all of you are familiar with as well as our support groups, our oncology life coach, our yoga classes, Pilates, um, creative writing, and many, many, many other um, things that without the money raised by Team Spirit, we would not be able to offer to, to everyone. And we truly feel that that is um, a part of survivorship, and it's a part of healing and our um, health and emotional journey. So, so I hope you'll join us. And so you're probably wondering, well, how can I be involved? Well, I'll tell you. So um, we have a very ambitious goal this year, $250,000 to raise. We raised $200,000 last year, so we're, we're challenging ourselves this year, but it does take a community. So looking for any way that you can help support that effort. Uh, we have sponsorships, so you can become a sponsor anywhere from $1,000 on up to however much you would like to spend. Uh, underwriting opportunities for things like our food and beverages or our t-shirts or our beach games. We're trying to really make it a festive atmosphere this year. And um, maybe you'd like to be featured in one of our e-blasts that goes out and an opportunity to tell your story and share that with others and provide inspiration. And, and a chance to say why you walk with us. And, or form a team, you know, get a group of your friends, your family, um, your community to um, join together and fundraise and come out and join us for a walk on the beach. So if you're interested in any of those opportunities, please see um, Gabby or myself we'll, or Anna, we'll be back in the, um, at the booth uh, during the lunchtime. And um, please take the lawn signs. And as Renee mentioned, the email went out this morning. Registration is now open. It is a early bird pricing, $35. So, um, so please sign up soon. That um, will go away on July 25th, and then the, the rates go up from there. So um, please join us on the 26th. If you have any questions at all, I'll be hanging around. And I hope to see you all out there. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, good morning everyone. Again, like she said, my name is Elise Faye Ballin. It is such a privilege to be here speaking with you today. And for those of you, we are here to honor a quote of encouragement. Cancer is only going to be a chapter in your life, not the whole story. Your story will become someone else's survivor guide. As mentioned, I'm the clinical research operations manager and I oversee clinical trials across the Memorial Care Health System for interventional radiology, cardiology, and the biggest of them all, oncology. The number of people affected by cancer is increasing, and through participating in clinical trials, we can test current or newly developed treatments or procedures to improve patient outcomes. We currently have 30 plus clinical trials open to enrollment treating a wide range of cancer diagnoses. Clinical trials allows for access to high quality care, such as closer monitoring or, dedicated, or a dedicated research team. More options to receive potentially better treatments, and more importantly, they can benefit future patients. I'm going to highlight a couple of clinical trials. You may have heard of the GRAIL Pathfinder 2 study, which is a study that may help improve early cancer detection through a blood draw, looking for signals that may be present and may be associated with cancer. Uh, associated with cancer. 
We have enrolled a total of 875 patients and enrollment for this study ends in mid-July. So if you're over 50 and interested in participating in the please reach out to myself or one of my team members over there, raise your hand, um, we'll be around uh, this afternoon. Uh, we also have an upcoming trial open in September called the All of Us Program, where we will be seeking participants willing to take part in surveys and provide blood or saliva samples that will be used to create a robust, diverse database in an effort to advance individualized healthcare. Be on the lookout for that on the Memorial Care website for more details. Clinical research is vital to the advancement of medical care in all areas. I've been working in research for 10 plus years, and if there's anything I've learned, the fight is not easy. No battle is, but that's the very reason why I believe participating in clinical research allows patients the opportunity to have an extra support system that can come alongside them to guide them not only through the ups and downs of fighting this disease, but to be available to them and their families. This is why everyone involved plays an important role in that chapter of your story, which again, then eventually becomes someone else's survivor guide. Thank you for having me. Hi, again, my name is Diane. Thank you, Randall, for giving me a minute and a half. Because um, I can do it. Um, <laughs> healing Odyssey, um, I describe as the doctors heal your body, Healing Odyssey heals your mind. And they have workshops that deal on living and staying in the moment, dealing with fear, and they deal with the fear from dealing with your scans to death, to anything in between. They will teach you how to manage your fear. They have um, a laughter workshop that you will laugh like you haven't laughed pre-cancer. It is, the um, women come in on Friday for this weekend retreat, it's up in Running Springs near Lake Arrowhead, and they leave on Sunday, and some of them look like different people. They have changed that much. I guarantee you will make a friend. So especially for the mentors, if you could grab your mentee and book a, a spot, there's about 20 openings. We just had a board meeting. Normally it's $250 for your lodging, your meals, and all the workshops. One of the board members is sponsoring you ladies, it would be $100 for the weekend. Um, this, the website probably isn't even updated yet. You can, scan, oops, you can scan the little code and sign up. Or for those that aren't techie, over here on the table are little flyers in the brochure. You can mail a check. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations, survivors. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm Nancy Lomibau, the Chief Clinical Officer and Program Director at Cancer Support Community South Bay, and this is Rebecca, or some of you know her as Becca Thull. She's the Program Manager. We provide free psychosocial support for cancer patients and their loved ones, and we do this virtually and in person. We have our calendars that are over there that uh, represent the different support groups, educational workshops, our healthy lifestyle and exercise classes, and everything you can imagine for the family, including for children and teens, uh, and support people in your lives. So I encourage you to please pick up a calendar. But I do have a, a ask today. Uh, we are really working hard to move better into Long Beach and to serve Long Beach better. Our whole service area includes the South Bay, Long Beach, and Orange County. And this year, we're really committed to Long Beach. But we would love to hear from you. So what is also on that table is a needs assessment. It's only four questions. There's also pens over there. That's your prize. If you complete the four <laughs> questions, you can keep the pen. Um, but it's really, really important for us to know what kinds of services do you want to see here in Long Beach, or what do you want to see more of? So thank you in advance. Um, I would love to see some turned in. Uh, but again, congratulations. Thank you for having me be here. And I hope um, you guys have a wonderful luncheon because you deserve it. Good morning. And it is an honor to be here and join in your celebration. And congratulations to all of you and to your support. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it's also an honor to introduce to you to Dr. Nisi Sapogu, who is our medical director of the new Women's Heart Center at Long Beach Memorial. We are so pleased to have her. She has, comes with a wealth of expertise and education. She even did a second fellowship 
uh, with Dr. Uh, Noelle Mers, uh, who was one of the founding leaders of Women's Heart Health at the Barbara Streisand's Women's Heart Health Center at Cedar sinai But I think it is Dr. Sapogu's passion and her motivation for creating awareness of how, how, how heart disease, how heart conditions present differently in women and are unique to women. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Supogu. Good morning, everybody. Congratulations to all the cancer survivors. Let's cheer for them again. What an honor it is for me to stand here amongst all of you that have fought with the diagnosis, the treatment, the side effects, the anxiety of it, in dealing with all the aspects of it, and for people that supported you through this journey to stand here today as warriors so that you can inspire and educate people struggling with it or going through the journey again. So thank you so much for giving me this honor. Um, but the book doesn't really stop at surviving cancer, right? It goes on. And we want to focus on a healthy, good quality of life. And that's why I'm here today to talk about advocating for heart health in cancer survivors. So there you go. That's right. <laughs> this way. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Nisi Supogu. My last name is, has three syllables, Supogu. Supogu like super glue, that's what I tell my patients so they can remember me. And I'm a director for a Women's Heart Center here at Memorial Care Long Beach and striving together with my team to build on different subspecialties that can cater to women's heart health needs and cardio-oncology is one of the one of the subspecialty that I'm working on, working with the oncologists, uh, your primary care physicians, and me as the uh, specialist in women's heart health, the cardiologist, as you go through the treatments of cancer and beyond. All right. Without further ado, um, let me go into my slides. So. That's my congratulatory slide for all of you here, but the journey goes on. You've done a great job, so let's keep it up, all right? Um, so what, is, what do we need to do for cancer screening after, uh, cardiac screening after cancer treatment, and who needs to be screened? Um, I did not go into all the details, but some of the, well-known details that patients who would have received anthracyclines, um, patients who had chest radiation based on the dosage and the side of the chest that the uh, radiation was done, patients with bone marrow transplant, patients on prescription with tyrosine kinase inhibitors for renal cell cancer, leukemia, patients on immunotherapies with uh, melanoma and lung cancer, and the list goes on, but these are a specific few conditions at least to be aware of that definitely you have to be screened for cardiac diseases at the time of cancer, during the treatment, after the treatment, and several decades as we keep going and living life, right? So how do we do the surveillance? So there's few things that we can do, just like any other patient, and especially female patients, we need to risk stratify individual patients' risk for cardiac uh, conditions, right? So we can do that with this basic risk calculator called the ASCVD risk calculator, which incorporates just basic things about you. But as you can see here, uh, there's some risk enhancers where the risk calculator doesn't really incorporate these risk enhancers. So despite the score you may get on the ASCVD risk factors, it's good to be aware of the individualized risk factors. And cancer does fall under one of the inflammatory diseases conditions as well. Um, so it's good to start off uh, with the basis, like am I a low risk, am I an intermediate risk, am I a high risk? If I'm a low risk, are there 
other risk enhancers that I need to be aware of? And what can I do to mitigate the risk? And this is a question your primary care can deal with you, or you can come to a cardiologist and they can help understand what your risk is. And then basic cardiac surveillance like echocardiogram has evolved so much, an ultrasound of the heart. Some of you would have been on treatments where we monitored you through your therapies while you were on it to make sure you didn't uh, develop decrease in the heart function, and some of you were still monitoring after the treatments are done. And we, uh, echocardiogram has evolved so much with specific calculations like strain, which helps us understand the function of the myocardial cells in the walls of the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and we have 3D imaging that helps us to get a very accurate assessment so that when we do serial examinations, there's specific things that we can compare and look for. And then nuclear imaging will help us understand if your symptoms are translating to an abnormality that needs an intervention. Cardiac MRI helps us understand if there's any infiltration like fibrosis or scar because of radiation or long-term effects of chemotherapy. And it also gives us specific cardiac calculations to follow through while you're undergoing treatments. I, I made a special side slide for coronary CT and coronary artery calcium score because the, the coronary artery calcium score has really changed a lot of preventative therapies. So for patients, even at low risk or low to intermediate risk and are hesitant to be on, say, cholesterol-lowering medications, or they have significant history, they're really not symptomatic, but they want to be cautious, or you've been through the cancer history now and you want to know the risk, we could do a coronary calcium score, which helps us understand what the amount of plaque that's present in your blood vessels of the heart so we can tailor the treatment accordingly to prevent you from having an obstructive coronary artery disease or a heart attack. And then coming to basic guidelines for physical activity, I put here the American Cancer Society guidelines, um, but even for cardiovascular outcomes, uh, just an exercise uh, level of minimum of 150 minutes a week, so that's about 30 minutes a day, five times a week, um, with moderate ex exercise, and not because, oh, you're very active, you're taking care of your children, or taking care of your grandchildren, or you run a lot of errands, or you take care of cleaning the house, and it's a big house. No, special time dedicated for exercise, 30 minutes of walking, walk a little fast, you know, break a sweat, you know, pause for a little bit because you're tired. So things like that, where you do 30 minutes a day, five times a week, so a minimum of 150 weeks. And if I were to look at you over 10 years of time, you would have reduced cardiovascular disease in yourself by 24%, which is pretty significant. It's almost like I'm giving you a medication to treat your blood pressure, okay? So very profound impact that exercise has on, on the outcomes for cardiovascular health. And also diet, of course, I, I put this again from American Cancer Society, but for cardiovascular health, we do recommend like a Mediterranean kind uh, style of diet that's rich in vegetables and fruits and whole grains and proteins that are healthy for you. Uh, so you avoid red and processed meat, sugar, sweetened beverages, highly processed food and ref refined grain products. So that's all I have for you guys. Oh, and alcohol, I forgot about that. So, <laughs> so ideally, no alcohol is great, right? But if you do drink alcohol or you enjoy a glass of wine with your food, then for women to restrict alcohol to one glass a day is good for their outcomes. And if you're a man, you're restricted to two glasses of drink per day or two servings of drink per day is good for your cardiac outcomes. Well, thank you all so much for giving me this time to talk to you guys today. 
And uh, if you have any questions, I have my email up there. I respond very quickly to emails. Please feel free to email me with any questions. And if you feel like you need to get checked, get your hearts checked, please call to schedule or email me, and I'll set you up with the scheduling. Um, you can follow up with me. I'm a women's heart health specialist, or with anybody in your community, wherever you live. But, but make sure you contribute to this ongoing uh, survivorship and survive all other chronic comorbidities of life as well. Good luck to you all and thank you so much. Good morning. Usually I have fancy slides with bullet points and pretty graphs and things, but this one's from the heart. There you go. So I've been a, a, an oncology nurse for 43 years. I pretty much started at birth. Um, <laughs> I first worked at UCLA, and then I worked at Cedar sinai for 26 years, and then I've been at Long Beach Memorial for the last 10 years. I always wanted to be a nurse from the time I was really young. My family said, why don't you be a doctor? And no offense to doctors, I love doctors. Well, some of them anyway. But um, I knew the difference, and I always wanted to be a nurse. What I didn't always want to be was a cancer patient. But one day, I was sitting at my desk in the cancer center, and I work right next to the breast center, and I was playing with a necklace, and I fe felt a lump. And I walked next door, and I said, if you get any cancellations today, I'd love to get a mammogram. And because I work there, and they know me, they said, sure, come on back, and we'll do it right now. When we were done, the, the radiologist, who I also is one of my colleagues, came out and said, what you felt was nothing, but we see something on the other side. Because I work here, I was able to get scheduled for a biopsy really quickly, and I was able to get scheduled for an MRI even faster than that. Uh, after the, the day after the biopsy, I came into work, and the doctor I work with, I said, oh, I had a biopsy yesterday, and he said, oh, it'll be nothing, it'll be fine. You know, 80% of these things are nothing to ever worry about, you'll be fine. But I'll call the pathologist just to reassure you. So I sat there while he called the pathologist, and his face turned white as a ghost, and he got tears in his eyes, and when he hung up, he was all flustered and was so afraid to tell me that the pathology showed that I had invasive breast cancer. Now, my reaction about having breast cancer was the same as yours. We get disbelief, horror, fear, but my first reaction was, oh my gosh, my poor friend just had to tell me that I had breast cancer. I, I felt so sorry for, for him. After all, I'm an oncology nurse and I'm a Jewish mother, <laughs> so the empathy in my personality runs really deep. I'm supposed to take care of other people, not have people taking care of me. It would be good if I could tell you that after taking care of patients who had cancer, that getting the diagnosis myself made me more empathetic to people that have cancer. But I honestly think that I always felt empathy for people who had cancer. What I do have more empathy for people going through any diagnosis is the difficulties navigating the system. It's horrible. It's horrible. And I know all the backline numbers, and it was still horrible for me waiting on hold to get things scheduled, waiting for authorizations, waiting for appointments, waiting for results. The waiting can be maddening. Now my waiting may have been easier than yours, but I also, the harder part is that I have to relive it all the time with my patients, with the lectures that I go to and hear about the chance of, oops, sorry, the chance of recurrence is what it is, it is what it is. Um, I learned, but I did learn the importance of having a person to help navigate the healthcare system with you and of having an advocate. It could not be more important. Everybody needs a healthcare advocate. I do it with my friends all the time. Sometimes I wish I had fewer friends, but it, it really does help. I had my, one of my friends sitting that I work with literally led me by the nose and said, this is what we're going to do next. I might as well have been a plumber or a butcher or whatever. I was just, I didn't know what to do and people led me through it. Um, I needed to be led around and told what to do. I was used to telling people what to do next, and instead I was put in an incredibly vulnerable position where I had to listen to other people tell me what to do. 
I needed to trust other people to make decisions for me instead of me making decisions for others. I never cried. I wouldn't let myself be vulnerable. In fact, I was given six months off work with full pay, and I took three weeks. I didn't want to be a patient. I wanted to be a nurse. And actually, I wouldn't have even taken the three weeks, except, I don't know, Cindy, if you remember this, but sitting in a staff meeting one day, I fell fast asleep. I had just, I, I was in the middle of radiation, and I used to think, oh, radiation, why do people complain? This is easy, it doesn't make you tired. And literally, in the middle of a staff meeting, I was out cold, and my manager said, go home, and don't come back for a while. The checkups are still scary for me, and you and I know for my patients, for, for you and I, I know for my patients, I try to call them right away when I get results, especially if it's a Friday afternoon and the results are good. I, never, I try to never make them wait till Monday. It's horrible. Yeah. Surviving cancer has led to a newfound sense of purpose, resilience, and certainly gratitude. I'm so grateful for my health and the people in my life. I enjoy each and every day. I learned that it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to let other people help me. I share my story with my patients when it's appropriate. It often helps me connect with them by letting them know that I have walked in their shoes. I love our mentors. I, our mentors are the best. Gosh, are the, are the best. I strive to be them one day. Oh, and by the way, if anybody ever offers me six months off with full pay again, I'm taking it. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but hopefully Randall will give me 30 more seconds because I feel like I, <laughs> I meant to be here because I also worked with Dr. Superglue's mentor, Dr. <laughs> Noel Barry Mers up at Cedars years ago doing acupuncture research, not only on women's cardiac disease, but also on what acupuncture can do for hot flashes, which I'm sure some of you can relate to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, I wasn't planning on talking about the research, and Susan also worked at Cedars. And the third thing is that it's the 25th year anniversary of the, the walk, and in October will be my 25th anniversary of my clinical practice. So, Dr. here we go. Dr. Panovich, excuse me for just a minute. I just want to tell them that the slides will be available. I see a, hmm. I see a lot of you taking notes, which you're wonderful students, and we love how studious you are. And we will be sending you copies of the slides. We will be sending you the video of the event, I should say. So you're good to go. Thank you for that interruption. The video, I hope my hair looks okay. So anyway. <laughs> All right, so I'm always excited to talk about uh, traditional Chinese medicine, which is the medical system, again, that I've been doing for 25 years now because it is such a safe and highly effective complementary option for people, but most people just don't understand what it is and how it works. And hopefully at the end of this 20 minute talk, um, I will have answered those questions. And if I haven't answered everything, just find me during lunch and I can answer any other questions that you have. All right. So what is TCM, traditional Chinese medicine? Well, it truly is the oldest medicine known to humankind with written texts dating as far back as 2800 BC. So given this, it's pretty safe to say that the practice of TCM has withstood the test of time and truly only gains in popularity because more and more people are realizing how powerful this practice is. We aim to prevent and or heal disease by restoring balance in the body, and I'll talk about that more in depth here shortly. TCM is definitely a very complex system with terms like yin and yang and qi and meridians and on and on, um, things that I don't talk about in the office because you will look at me like a deer in headlights. And so I don't talk about those, but I am going to try and, try and simply um, define those today. So what I'm going to talk about today are terms that most of you have probably heard, um, yin and yang, or as they say in America, yin and yang, um, meridians and qi. So this whole, the terms yin and yang and the concept of yin and yang, right, basically they represent in broadest uh, sense uh, this balance of opposites. So it's the life forces, they're opposite yet interconnected, these self-perpetuating cycles that cannot survive alone. So they're, they're um, 
interdependent, and that is why in this circle you see a little black within the white and a little white within the black, because without these opposites being balanced, we no longer survive. So if you think about that, they postulated this theory thousands of years ago that our bodies were all about balance, right? Before they actually had the ability to actually look inside the body and know what's going on. But now in modern medicine, we do realize that we are um, just this living presence of balances all the time. You think about our nervous system. We've got our sympathetic nervous system, that flight or fight, that get up and go. And you have the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system that calms us down so that we can rest and digest. And just like our hormonal system, right? I think we all in this room know that when our hormones aren't balanced, we don't feel very good. And even at the cellular level, um, it's always communicating about what goes in and what goes out. And even when you talk about cancer, right? We all have cancer cells, but within our body, when things are balanced, we're able to kind of kill those cancer cells. But when things get out of balance, all of a sudden they gain momentum, they start to gather friends, and then all of a sudden, you know, cancer tumors um, take over. So this whole concept of yin and yang really is what we live and breathe 24 seven of our entire lives. So the meridian system. So the TCM meridian system is composed of, we believe there are several channels that traverse the body, and within those channels, they carry chi, which we call our life force, right? Is it blood, is it oxygen, is it body fluids? We don't really know, but we've termed it chi. And this um, system carries this energy throughout our body. So when it's balanced, we're healthy and we feel good. But when it's not balanced, um, that is when we start to feel symptoms. So we use this um, to drive our diagnostic criteria. So you can think of it like uh, the freeway, the 405 freeway. When traffic's flowing smooth, we're all happy. But say there's a car crash. So in Chinese medicine, that would be considered that the energy is stagnated and not flowing. So you can imagine everything behind that stagnation is not going to uh, work very well because things are too congested. But likewise, things in front of that traffic jam or that chi stagnation is not getting enough nourishment. And so what we notice is that there, if there are certain imbalances in your meridian system, different symptoms will be associated with that. And that is basically how we diagnose what's going on with you. The thing that I love most about my medicine is that it's your individual presenting symptoms that lead to your diagnosis, right, and drive your treatment protocol. So I could see 10 of you and give each of you a different treatment because you're coming in with your own set of, of symptoms. Um, so it's very individualized. And again, the ultimate goal, right, is to balance out the spiridian system so that your body can heal itself. So what do we use when we treat you, when you come in to see someone who practices Chinese medicine? Well, there are a few different modalities that we use, but today I'm gonna to focus on acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine because that is what we do 95% of the time. So what is acupuncture? I think we all kind of know what it is. It's basically um, the insertion of very fine needles into points along the meridians, right, in, in order to manipulate that chi or that energy. There are about 400 acupuncture points on the body, and no, I don't use them all at one time. Um, and research has proven that acupunct acupuncture is very effective in treating a plethora of health issues, from physical and body ailments, your emotional and mental health, as well as improving your immunity. So let's talk about what acupuncture can do for the side effects of breast and other cancers, and as well as what it can do in preventing reoccurrence. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about, it's called a meta-analysis, which basically means they take all the different individual research um, uh, that's out there, and then they compile uh, a, um, all of the different um, results and put them into one little paper. And so what they found is that acupuncture uh, may improve breast cancer treatment-related symptoms, including uh, quality of life, Decrease in pain, fatigue, hot flashes, sleep disturbances, and anxiety, right? All those things that, that people suffer from. And that's specifically for breast cancer. When you look at just uh, 
general side effects of cancer, kind of the same thing pops up, right? The strongest evidence has always been that acupuncture is so good for any type of nausea and vomiting. Basically, any GI symptoms, um, Chinese medicine is truly the bomb for. Um, they've also, again, found in just general cancer side effects that we help with fatigue, anxiety, um, and depression, insomnia, dry mouth, um, and improved quality of life, right? Because if all those things are helped, your quality of life is definitely going to be improved. And that's when you compare it to people who don't integrate acupuncture into their care. And then one of the uh, most recent studies was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and what they found is that acupuncture significantly reduces survivor's chronic pain. But let's talk about what it can do for your immune system, right, because that's so important. So research has shown promising results related to acupuncture for reducing, um, reducing inflammation and enhancing your immune system. And the reason that's important is because chronic inflammation, we now know, is the main underlying mechanism in many kinds of chronic diseases, including cancer. And so it's this anti-inflammatory effect of acupuncture that is the key mechanism in treating chronic disease and enhancing the immune system. The other interesting thing about acupuncture is that there are different types of immunity in our body, and it actually helps both our innate and the adaptive immune responses. So it, it hits all of it. But how does it work? How does it work when you're sticking needles in your body? How does all this stuff happen? Well, it's amazing what research has found is that acupuncture has a huge systemic effect in your body. So as soon as we give you an acupuncture treatment, what happens is that this regulatory effect on the body acts on multiple systems simultaneously, um, and more specifically, in the regulation of your neural endocrine immune network. So if you want to break that down, it, it basically calms down your nervous system, it balances out your hormones, and it actually um, upregulates your immune system all at the same time, believe it or not. Um, so these needles are pretty powerful. And what they found in Western medicine, right, is that that network, that NEI network, is actually our biological basis to maintain our body's homeostasis. So here we come back to this whole balance thing, is that when this particular network is balanced, we actually are able to heal ourselves um, quite well. So, <laughs> right, we all know and Susan just talked about it, as soon as you get the cancer diagnosis, your increase in stress and anxiety is off the charts, right? You're human. So what can acupuncture do for um, anxiety and depression? Well, we've kind of already talked about it, and again, a review of the literature on cancer-related side effects found that acupuncture is helpful with both anxiety and depression. And this, I just wanted to talk about this one study uh, that recently came out that showed that acupuncture had a large effect on reducing anxiety and depression compared to conventional treatments that we're all used to, so your pharmaceutical intervention and psychotherapy. In fact, it reduced your symptoms twice as much. And I have found that in my practice that when it comes to anxiety and depression, acupuncture is really, really good. And if you're on pharmaceuticals, it actually makes them work even better. So it's very, very good for that. But why is it important that we reduce that? Well, I think because we all know that anxiety and depression, right, they lead to immune system impairment, and so we need to treat those in order to make our immune system be able to work better. Um, one interesting study looked at the effects of acupuncture on the immune function impairment found in anxious women, and they showed that the effects of acupuncture on the immune function actually happened within three days of the first treatment, and then once these women were done with the entire treatment protocol, which was, I think, 10 acupuncture sessions, those positive changes in the immune system lasted up to a month. And I actually, when I treat people and after their, their symptoms have been reduced, if they want to continue to do maintenance, I usually do have them come in once a month because we know as long as we kind of do a treatment once a month, all those great effects that you have are going to stay there. All right, so let's talk about Chinese herbal medicine. So in order to talk about herbal medicine, we need to talk about the origins of medicine. Um, the oldest record of medicinal preparations from plants, animals, and minerals are those of the early Chinese dating back to the 28th century BC. Pharmaceuticals, on the other hand, have only really come into play in the 16th or 17th centuries. So if you do the math, we've had 4,400 years to practice our craft, um, which gives us a lot of time to figure out what works with what, to make sure we don't have side effects, to make sure we know what could be toxic 
or interact with medication. Um, the WHO estimates that 80% of the people in the world actually still use traditional medicines uh, for a few reasons. One is because um, they like it better. There's usually not um, a lot of side effects involved. But the other thing is they just don't really have access to the pharmaceuticals that we here in America do. And again, a lot of the medication that you use today and that you get from your pharmacy are all uh, plant-derived. But specifically about Chinese herbal medicine. So within our pharmacopoeia, within what I do, there are over a thousand individual herbs that I can choose from. However, Chinese herbs are rarely taken individually. We always put them in a multi-herb formula to make sure that everything's balanced and it allows us to then treat these problems from different avenues, right? Because as we've talked about, your body can, af can be affected in many different ways. And so these herbal formulas have different herbs that hit the body one way and hit it another way. And so that is why they are usually so incredibly effective. Um, again, they are extremely safe when prescribed by a licensed practitioner and rarely interact with Western pharmaceuticals. And just like the acupuncture, the formulas that I put people on are individualized according to your health needs, right? So you're not gonna be put on the same herbal formula that your neighbors put on. It's all based about what you need. So a little bit on the research for uh, uh, Chinese medicine for breast cancer treatment. Again, a recent meta-analysis stated that complementary Chinese herbal uh, therapy may demonstrate clinical benefits for breast cancer patients in terms of tumor response and in terms of survival, which is all good news. Um, and then there was one study that specifically looked at um, people with HER2 positive breast cancer. And what they found is that the herbal formula that they used improved the micro environment of the tumor cell, which basically means um, it helped keep the good cells from turning bad and therefore it stopped the cell proliferation and the metastasis of the cancer. So all good things. And let's talk about the safety of Chinese herbs because I know it makes everyone nervous. Um, but any formula that we use does follow the standards of current good manufacturing practices established by the US Food and Drug Administration and World Health Organization. The company that I use most often has a seed to shelf consciousness, which means we, they, <laughs> maintain accountability from the origins of the seeds, the planting, the harvesting, the testing, all of that. They make sure that every step is high quality. In fact, the company that I use actually has an increased standard of quality control by testing um, for the safety of each heavy metal, right? Because everything's allowed a little bit of heavy metals within it. Um, but they teach, they make sure that each specific heavy metal is underneath what the, um, the FDA approves rather than looking at a total metal account because some people can kind of get under the system. Well, they may have a lot of arsenic but really low in lead and when you look at the total, it looks like, oh, it's fine. But we want everything to be low in anything that we may be giving. And also, always to quell your worries when it comes to herbal medicine, you should always tell your doctors what you're taking and what you're on. And what I always tell people, because some people are always like, was it going to hurt my liver? Is it going to hurt my kidneys? Well, what I tell people to do is actually just go get a lab, some lab work done, and get those levels um, known before we start, and then go back three months later to make sure that you know everything is still working just fine. All right, but what I really want to talk about is that acupuncture and Chinese herbs really are just one part of the answer, right? So the origins of cancer and the prevention of reoccurrence are multifactorial, right? Again, chronic inflammation is a big player. Your gut health is a, plays a big role in that chronic inflammation. Growth factors that we have, your genetics, your epigenetics, right? Getting acupuncture or taking herbs cannot override un unhealthy lifestyles. Like, I wish I could say, come see me and we'll get rid of all those things, but that's not gonna happen. You've gotta do your part. However, Acupuncture and Chinese herbs can give you your best fighting chance. Why? Because 70 to 80% of your immune system is in your gut. Chronic inflammation, which I just said, um, is the core to all chronic diseases, including cancer, starts in your gut. Again, 70 80% of your immune system is there. So what can acupuncture and Chinese herbs do for you? Well, Chinese herbs, herbal formulas, are fantastic for healing the gut, therefore boosting your immune system. Acupuncture and Chinese herbal formulas are great at reducing stress, anxiety, and depression, right? Therefore, boosting your immune system. 
Um, and as well, acupuncture and Chinese herbs uh, are great for treating insomnia and therefore boosting your immune system. So I think that you get the picture here. I see some people uh, with the fan back there. It's also good for reducing hot flashes. Um, so anyway, on and on and on, right? So there are so many things that it can do to help your body help itself. And that's what this medicine is about, is trying to get your body to be able to heal itself. So in conclusion, uh, major cancer hospitals today are all integrating acupuncture into their uh, approach for cr cancer treatment because they know it's so helpful. And because of the multi-level effect on the body, uh, TCM can both ease your symptom burden, right? And at the same time, we're re-engaging the immune system um, so that, again, to make you as healthy as possible. The treatments usually work very quickly. I can tell you um, if I'm giving you the right formula or when we're doing the right um, needles, you're gonna feel better within two to three, four days. Like, it is quick, all right? And all the research I discussed here was on the effects of acupuncture by itself and Chinese herbs by themselves, um, but not on the combination of acupuncture and Chinese herbs together, which is really how we practice the medicine. It hasn't been researched the way we've practiced because when you put the two together, <laughs> that's when the fireworks start. All right, if you have any other questions, um, again, see me during lunch. I'm sitting at the back table. We're I think good. I did it. Yeah, I did it. it. <laughs> so as a physical therapist, my job is to improve movement. It's to reduce pain. It's to re restore function. And it's to prevent disability. So today we're going to talk about a topic that's often uncomfortable. But I want us to get comfortable talking about it because Pelvic floor dysfunctions happens to many, many people, and I don't want anyone to feel like they're alone in that journey. And I also want people to feel at the end of this that you can advocate for yourself. The prevalence of pelvic floor disorders is higher in the gynecological cancer survivors than our general population. Pelvic floor disorders include any of the following, urinary incontinence, bowel incontinence, prolapse, pain with sex, pelvic pain. The rate of incidence of each of these disorders, it varies depending on the type of gynecological cancer. But due to estrogen suppression, it can also affect people with breast cancer. 75% of breast cancer survivors will experience some form of genitourinary symptoms. And those include vaginal dryness, painful intercourse, irritation with external genitalia, pain with urination, and urinary incontinence. In a study in 2022 looking at urinary incontinence for those who've gone through breast cancer versus the general population, 68% of women with breast cancer experience urinary incontinence. How often have your doctors brought that up as a side effect? <laughs> so today, we're gonna look and review the anatomy of the pelvis, functions of the pelvic floor muscles, we're gonna talk about pelvic floor dysfunction. We're gonna talk about what happens in a physical therapy evaluation. And we're gonna talk about physical therapy treatment. So our pelvic floor muscles are like this big hammock. It goes from our front, our pubic bone, all the way to our tailbone. And look what it's supporting. So on top of that, you'll see in yellow the bladder. With the male genitalia, you'll see um, that the prostate sits right below there. There's a tube that comes from the bladder called your urethra, and that's how the urine exits our body. If we have female genitalia, 
you'll see that there's the uterus. And finally, we have the bowel that exits through the anus. Now, did you know that those pelvic floor muscles, that hammock of muscles that start at the pubic bone and go back to the tailbone, that's part of your core stability. It's very, very important that those muscles are functioning appropriately. They work in conjunction with a lot of other muscles. So at the top of our core is our diaphragm. That's our breathing muscle. I want you guys all to sit upright, away from your chairs. We're going to find that diaphragm muscle. You're going to put your hand just below your rib cage, but above your belly button. I want you to take a nice, deep breath. As you take a nice inhalation, you should feel that diaphragm muscle. It's going to protrude down and out. So go ahead and take a few deep breaths. At the same time as you inhale, what you aren't readily noticing is that the pelvic floor is actually lengthening. So can you imagine if you have breathing problems that there's an incoordination between the base of their core, the pelvic floor, and the top, the diaphragm muscle. Now in front of us is our abdominal muscles. And the deep abdominal muscles they actually tie also um, effectively working with our pelvic floor muscles. And then, of course, we have our back muscles. A lot of muscles coordinate together. The pelvic floor is the base of the group of muscles referred to as your core. These muscles are located in your pelvis and stretch like a hammock from the pubic bone at the front to the tailbone at the back and from side to side. They support the bladder, bowel and uterus and play an important role in bladder and bowel control and sexual function. If your pelvic floor muscles don't work well, you may leak when you do things like coughing, sneezing, lifting, laughing, or exercising. To stop this from happening, you need to switch on your pelvic floor muscles. To switch on the pelvic floor muscles, you need to squeeze and draw in the muscles around your vagina, as if you are trying to stop the flow of urine. Lift them up inside. Breathe normally. Don't hold your breath or tighten your buttocks. Then let go and relax the pelvic floor muscles completely. Notice as you tighten and lift your pelvic floor muscles, they tighten and close around the anal passage, vagina and urethra. By exercising the pelvic floor regularly, you will train your muscles to work automatically when they are needed. So I want you to sit again um, upright. If you are facing sideways, um, go ahead and square off your hips so that you're not twisted in the trunk. If you have female genitalia, you are going to try to do that upward lift movement. And it, the best the way I can describe it is if you were sucking through a straw, like a milkshake or a smoothie. <laughs> if you have male genitalia, you are going to shorten your penis or retract your penis. And you can also try to squeeze around the anus. <laughs> Go ahead, let's do a little contraction of our pelvic floors. Squeeze and lift. <laughs> How many of you are feeling like your bottom muscles are kicking in or your stomach muscles are overriding? Yes. A lot of muscles want to help out, but they're not invited to the party. <laughs> we need to be able to isolate those pelvic floor muscles because they need to be strong. You just saw 
How many things are sitting on top of those pelvic floor muscles? That's a lot of weight. So let's look now about the functions of the pelvic floor. There are several. They're not all listed up here. They support the pelvic organs. They control bowel and bladder function. They help with the passing of urine and feces. They play a role in sexual function. They help with breathing. And of course, they tie in with pregnancy and childbirth. So this is a little bit of pelvic floor dysfunctions. The first category is urinary disorders. And we can't talk about urinary disorders unless you know how your bladder is supposed to function. And the best thing I can show you right now is through a very rudimentary demonstration with my yellow balloon. So we've got our bladder. At the neck of the bladder is a muscle called a sphincter. As the bladder is filling up, the sphincter is tightening up so that we don't leak. Down the string here is our urethra, so how the urine gets out of our body. Sometimes this doesn't work so well. Sometimes this muscle is weak, and if, we weak, if it's weak, there's potential to leak, okay? Sometimes it's the bladder muscle itself that it's just squeezing at the wrong time. And if it's getting too much pressure there, then the potential is that we're going to have this muscle relax, open up, and we're going to release urine when we don't want it. In order for us to function well, we have to not only have the muscles working, we have to also have the nerves working to those muscles, and we have to be able to feel that urge to go and physically be able to get up and go. So a lot of times we have incontinence for various reasons. Sometimes, like I said, it, maybe it's a bladder control issue. Maybe it's the muscle around the bladder is just contracting when it's not supposed to. Maybe we can't empty the bladder all the way. Maybe it's us physically, we can't have arthritis or cognitive issues and we just can't up and get up and get going when we want to get going. Another category is prolapse. In our pelvic area, we sometimes get the descent of the, bo the bowel, the bladder, or the uterus. So it drops where it shouldn't be going. Then we have emptying disorders. And emptying disorders is where we have difficulty urinating or moving our bowels. Then there's pain. Sometimes we have pain in our low back, in our hips, our bladder, or in our pelvis, in the urethra itself. Then there's defecatory disorders. So we have fecal incontinence. We've got constipation. And then, of course, sexual dysfunction, um, pain with penetration, pain with orgasm. That's all part of pelvic floor dysfunction. So as physical therapy, you get the referral from any of your doctors. We are going to ask a lot of personal questions. And it's important to get a very clear picture of what's going on in your body. We are going to go through a quick musculoskeletal screen because I want to see, is your posture affecting your pelvic floor? Is your way you're breathing having an issue with your pelvic floor? Do you have joint problems in your back, in your hips, that is affecting your pelvic floor? The way you're walking, is that affecting your pelvic floor? Then I'm going to use my 3D model that some of you have, if you've stopped by the table, you've seen. And I'm going to explain to you how the pelvic floor works. And then we're going to look at the pelvic floor function with, at 
with you. Now at this point, your therapist will always ask you if you're comfortable with having this done. There is an external exam and an internal exam. You never, ever, ever have to do anything you're not comfortable with. You 100% can bring someone with you into the evaluation and the subsequent treatment if you'd like. If that is where you feel the safest with another person present, then by all means bring that person. So with an external exam, I'm, we're gonna feel around for bony landmarks, muscles around the pelvis. We're gonna observe the genitalia and examine the skin and look for muscle tenderness or trigger points. I wanna see how the pelvic muscles work and rest. And I wanna see if there's any prolapse of the organs. On the internal exam, vaginal or rectal, we're gonna feel for muscles of that, how strong your muscle is, how, how good can you contract those muscles? How long can you hold that contraction? That's muscle endurance. I'm gonna see if there's any tightness in there. And again, ability to contract and relax. Any areas of discomfort, just like any other muscle, you want to release that tension. And of course, we look for the prolapse of organs. And at the end, your physical therapist develops a treatment plan. And the treatment plan can include external or internal manual therapy. Maybe we need to massage out those areas that are too tight on you. Maybe it's behavior modifications that need to be addressed. So if you have fecal or, in, or urinary incontinence, we'll actually give you voiding logs. And for three days, I'm gonna ask you to write down a whole bunch of information about what you ate, what you drank, when you went to the bathroom, how much came out of you, did you feel an urge to go to the bathroom, did you have any leakage, and if you did have leakage, was it a small amount, a medium amount, a large amount? And was there any activity tied to when that leakage occurred? We might also address any movement changes. So how about if a lot of the problem is coming from back and hip tightness? Well, I need to address that. We're always gonna give you some stretches to do because all of us are tight somewhere in our body. And of course, strengthening exercises. So just like any other muscle group in your body, you can get your pelvic floor muscles a lot stronger. And so it's not just laying down that you do these exercises. You need to be trained laying down, sitting, standing, and doing movement in standing. Because we don't just lay down all day. We are upright. We live in an upright posture, and we better be able to stay strong in an upright posture. So today, again, my goal for you is that you start having a little bit more information to get comfortable bringing topics up to your doctor if you're having an issue. It is common. And if your doctor's not bringing it up, I want you to advocate for yourself. It starts today. If you were at our table, I have a handout. <laughs> I have one for female genitalia and male genitalia. This is from the Continent Society National Continents Program. And it's going to explain how to do your pelvic floor contractions. You might not have an issue, but you know somebody who does. I guarantee it. So please do not leave here without your information packet. Again, I want you to become the advocate that we need out there. Thank you. Will we ever look at a balloon the same again? <laughs> 
I am pleased to uh, build on Michelle's presentation and introduce Dr. Joycelyn Craig. She serves as a medical director for the Pelvic Health Center here at Long Beach Memorial, and she also chairs the obstetrics and gynecology department at the hospital. And her practice is uh, her practice is Praxis Urogynecology, uh, just on the campus here. Uh, it's amazing. She has led this center for over 10 years and has really demystified an area that we, or I'll personalize it, I am a little shy to talk or reticent to talk to our providers about. And I think as Michelle stated, we should all feel empowered to do that. And with uh, Dr. Craig coming up here, she's really going to demystify that for you even further. And I have no doubt you will get a lot out of her presentation. So Dr. Craig. Hi there, thank you for letting me join you today and thank you to Randall for letting me go last. Um, I tried to cram in a family celebration today with this, so it's a little bit of getting the good of each but not the full picture, so thank you for letting me be here today. Um, I have had the pelvic health program now for uh, close to 10 years. I did my fellowship in urogynecology at UCI. I was their second fellow ever. Um, you have to be a urologist or a gynecologist first, so I don't do any baby deliveries, um, but I was briefly an OBGYN, and that's been really useful as a department chair going back to all of that and really pulling in how pelvic health is part of our entire lives, right? So really. A lot of what I do for the Public Health Center is education. One of the things we're doing this year is really working with the OB nurses to really address pelvic health in labor, after labor. I also have the residents from family medicine that come to my office that shadow so that they can learn more about pelvic health. We send them to be with the physical therapist whenever possible. And the OBGYN residents join me in surgery as well. So really trying to get education at many levels. Um, is it this one here? Okay. So today I tried to chose, choose some topics that you may or may not know are related to the lack of estrogen. Um, and it, there may be some overlap, but that's okay. Um, you briefly talked on genital urinary syndrome of menopause, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I want to talk about, briefly about recurrent bladder infections, which are also related to a drop in estrogen. And then we're going to talk about pelvic organ prolapse. So as you look at some of these things, you may, may be like, oh my goodness, right? Because none of this feels like a happy topic. But something came to me today when I was watching a nephew who's graduating from um, graduate school, watching my brother's granddaughter who's learning to walk, is the fact that at every stage of life, there's grieving and there's celebration, right? And sometimes it's easier to find the grieving and sometimes it's easier to find the celebration. We don't fault that baby for walking like this across the floor in her droopy diaper that's clearly wet, right? We celebrate her. And as a mother, I miss my children when they were little, but I am so glad I don't have to carry them around anymore, right? So as we go into a phase where our life changes, and a lot of that has to do with the lack of estrogen, there's some grieving, your body changes, but there's also a lot of celebration, and I hope that from everything you've heard from the speakers today, that you'll feel a lot of hope. And so that is my goal, to give you some hope on these topics, and to also just say, I ask everybody about their bowel and bladder stuff, so in my office, probably you're right, most, um, most physicians feel uncomfortable about talking about this topic, but in our office, we really do try to. So thank you for reminding us all about that. All right, so I hope you leave today feeling inspired and, and hopeful. Um, you know that it's a hot topic when Oprah has an entire magazine about menopause. I think it was her February or March issue. And I read it, I consider it my role to read all the magazines that go into our lobby. So I read it just to make sure, what is she telling people? And I thought it was very good, but in one page she says, hold on, it's about to get weird. And she's right, things change. Um, so 
all of these symptoms that you see here can be a factor of going through menopause, whether we're gonna call it a natural menopause, a surgical menopause, chemical, related to drops in estrogen. And it's a new phase of our lives. And I, I saw this torso um, in a park in The Hague last year when I was there for a meeting. And I, I took a picture of it because to me it represents the fact that all what happens in this phase of your life affects every organ system. It's a really change in brain chemistry, but it affects how our bodies function. So I like the picture and how it shows how all these factors fit together. You may not realize that your sleep disturbance or your bowel dysfunction or your bladder infections are related to changes in estrogen, but they are. And I really like the slide that you showed as well because all of these organ systems are all here together. They overlap and function or dysfunction sometimes. And it's really hard for us to talk about one organ system without the other um, because they're in such close connection. And, and there's connective tissue, there's muscles, there's nerve function. And all of these areas are affected by hormonal status, right? It is... Um, really impressive how much bowel and bladder dysfunction we see when women are in menopause where they lack estrogen, um, especially because of also how your microbiome changes in your vagina and your gut as well. So genitourinary syndrome is um, a term that was coined I'm gonna guess about 10 years ago, but like anything else, the coding and billing of it has not caught up. So we have to describe each symptom. But it is a collection of symptoms um, that are signs of a decrease in estrogen. And it can affect the structural changes of the external genitalia, the urethra, clitoris, and bladder. It can cause painful intercourse, vaginal dryness, overactive bladder and bladder pain. I think two of the symptoms that patients can come with that they don't realize are related to this are overactive bladder and um, bladder infections, okay? So um, sometimes it is a bladder infection, but sometimes it's just the lack of estrogen's effect in this tissue, and so we have to sort of delineate what's going on. The other symptom that you can see with um, genital urinary syndrome of menopause is overactive bladder. Urgent need to void, frequent voiding, a lot of bladder pressure, and sometimes it's just the fact that you need um, vaginal estrogen, but again, here's hope. If that's not an option, there's a lot of medications and things that we can do to help you. So um, this just outlines, again, sort of some of those symptoms. It might feel like an itching, a burning on the outside. When the urine hits the skin, a burning. Um, there can be a sense of lack of lubrication, um, discomfort and pain with all sorts of activities, even just maybe sometimes exercise, but definitely sexual function. Um, and a burning, this can happen sometimes. Patients will have burning of urination, but all their urine tests will be negative for infection. Not only is it due to the lack of estrogen, but it's also the fact that our collagen in our body changes. We have collagen everywhere. It's part of our matrix that holds us together. The vagina has its own type, and as we get older, it becomes inactive. So that changes it as well. We are born with something called elastin, which also changes over time. Elastin, fibrin, collagen, estrogen, those are all responsible for the distendability of our vagina and our lower bladder, and those change without estrogen. There's also less blood supply into the area. So what can happen is this tissue can be more um, thinner, it can be more vulnerable um, in, in situations such as sexual intercourse. There can be micro abrasions that then can allow for infections or allow for irritation that wasn't a factor before. Vaginal estrogen promotes um, improvement in all of these issues. It can reverse atrophy, right? It can increase libido to some extent. Um, again, libido is its own talk. There are so many different areas where that can, um, there can be dysfunction, right? But if, if sex was pleasurable and now it's painful, that can decrease libido. Um, 
Estrogen improves blood flow to the area and lubrication, and also vaginal compliance, which is, again, the distendability. There's all sorts of different ways to deliver estrogen to the vagina. And again, I'm just talking about vaginal estrogen, nothing by mouth and I'm nothing on the skin at this point. When estrogen is not an option, there are a lot of different moisturizers. So I've listed them here at the bottom and I probably don't even have all of them on the list. We got a, another box um, yesterday of some new um, lubricants that are on the market. So there's a lot of options um, if you explore them. This is just a statement uh, that came out of a study that was in the Green Journal just this year saying low-dose vaginal estrogen is the most effective treatment option for genital urinary syndrome of menopause with few side effects and minimal systemic absorption. The goal is to restore the microenvironment, the acidic pH, improve elasticity of the vagina, improve blood flow and secretions. This in turn reduces dryness and pain with intercourse and can improve urinary symptoms. Now, I know that that's not always an option, all right? Estrogen in any form is not always an option. But I think sometimes what happens is we as physicians get busy and um, it's important for the patient to have a chance to say, my doctor is asking if I can use vaginal estrogen. Would that be okay? And sometimes the, the physician doesn't have a chance to differentiate it. So my point is, a lot of times vaginal estrogen is safe, even if there's been a history of cancer, specifically breast cancer. In the few minutes that we have today, I'm not gonna be able to go over the criteria of who can or cannot use vaginal estrogen. I'm, I'm gonna try, but my, my take home to you is, is to ask. Ask if some of these things are options for you. Ask your physician, all right? So in endometrial cancers, a lot of times the vaginal estrogen is safe and can help with some of these symptoms in the, in the pelvic floor. Um, it's often okay in cervical cancer because it's not usually hormone mediated. However, if there is a uterus still there, um, it's important to also get progesterone. Ovarian cancer can also still be safe to use vaginal estrogen. And again, for breast cancer, there are specific criteria where short co course, low dose vaginal estrogen is safe. So always ask your oncologist, and I always ask the patient to ask the oncologist too, because I want us to all be in agreement. These are some other non-estrogen therapies that can be used for genitourinary syndrome of menopause. I tried to take a 10-page study and make one slide out of it, um, but this came out in September of 2023, and it was a systemic review of all the articles that are currently available on non-hormonal options for genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And so these um, tests or these medications on the left, I put some um, side effects to, to are noteworthy on the right. Um, but these are, can be options if vaginal estrogen is not possible. DHEA is a steroid um, that converts to estrogen and androgens in the vagina. It can often be used in cases where um, straight vaginal estrogen is not considered safe. Um, it is marketed as intrarosa, and um, there's a bunch of different doses that can be used, but patients' response to it and improvement in symptom control is definitely based on dose. The good news there is there's a bunch of different levels that you could try. Um, hyaluronic acid, um, if you look on the market, it's called Reverie, but it can be compounded by pharmacies. This is, a, this is something that brings in moisture, right? And it can be used in the vagina because what it does is create a film of protection over the epithelium. Um, you can also find it marketed with almond oil. Um, certain compounding pharmacies use vitamin E oil. Um, it's not going to actually change the tissue, but it can help with dryness, lubrication, and some protection um, to the epithelium in the vagina. Osfina um, is another option for, for all of these symptoms. It is actually taken orally, though. Um, it um, also affects the endometrial lining. It can reduce overactive bladder. 
Um, it can be helpful sometimes in UTIs. I don't use it as much because I would rather use local anything, and this is taken orally. So anytime you take something orally, it has there's some passage of it through the stomach and the gut that's not going to get to the patient. But it is an option for genital urinary syndrome of menopause. There are many different types of, of lasers now on the market that do some kind of CO2 stimulation to the vaginal tissue, specifically collagen. Um, they remodel collagen. Remember I said in the beginning that our collagen changes. Um, this is a treatment that's done in an office-based setting, and the idea is to stimulate collagen because that, if estrogen is not an option, can improve blood flow and lubrication. All right. It's not permanent. It does have to be repeated, usually on a on a yearly basis. All right. It can indirectly improve pH levels in the vagina, which can reduce urinary incontinence, but also reduce bladder infections. Testosterone can also be an option um, in the vagina as well. Um, I think that would be um, I put it at the at the bottom on purpose. That would be my last choice for for uh, many reasons. Um, but again, this is talk, talking about um, topical testosterone. Some of the side effects, though, can be an increase in acne, increase in liver function tests, and also hair growth. I know um, there are cases where patients are also using um, pellets that get implanted. Um, I hesitate a little bit with those because if those are in and there's a recurrence of a cancer, you, you really can't take those out. So in this case, it's, it's all... Um, topical vaginal as well. So this is just a brief summary of what these what's available, right? But these are the most that they gave support to. And the summary of this study was that um, there's enough support to say these might be options in patients who have a history of cancer, um, but more studies need to be done. All right. So my take home again is always talk to your doctor about your personal history and risks. All right. Um, just going to talk briefly about bladder infections. So women can get up to two bladder infections a year, and that's considered normal. Nobody wants to have that happen, but um, one or two a year is considered within a normal range. But beyond that, it really should be evaluated. And um, this gives sort of some criteria as to when it should be evaluated. It's based on the cultures that you've had within a certain time frame. And sometimes it's that the patient is ex um, experiencing exposure to many different bacteria. Sometimes it's the patient's health itself that might be the factor. But most of the time, E. coli is the most common cause of that, <clears throat> of bladder infections. And it really has to do with two things. One, E. coli is the most common bacteria that we have on our skin. Two, E. coli has a lot of resistant strains. And in a situation where the microbiome has changed, where somebody's health has changed, we're more susceptible to that. Um, there's other pathogens that can cause bladder infections. They're listed here. But again, um, E. coli is the most common. And one of the other things that we are also seeing is something called mycoplasma or urea plasma. This is actually detected in the vagina, but it can cause symptoms of bladder infection. And especially if you've had bladder infections repeated that don't show any bacteria, I would encourage you to ask your doctor to check for this. In patients who have immunosuppression, yeast can also cause bladder infections as well, all right? So here are some of the risk factors for recurrent bladder infections. So on the left are the known risk factors. Menopause, low estrogen is one of them. Um, pelvic floor disorders such as fecal incontinence. If, if there's soiling of, of that area and maybe it's not being cleaned enough away, then there's an increased risk of um, bladder infections. But on just a normal basis, the idea of wiping is not necessarily proven to be linked to recurrent bladder infections. I know we were all taught that. My mom told me that too, but it's, uh, um, but I feel like patients come in feeling bad. I I try to stay clean. I wipe, I do this and it doesn't matter. And the good news is, is that you're right. It, it doesn't matter. It, um, you're doing a good job. So, um, we do tell people to avoid leaving tampons in too long. If you've had recurrent bladder infections, do avoid bubble baths, things like that, but they don't necessarily change um, getting infections. 
One of the things that we ask patients to take if they're able to is something called D-mannose. And it is a simple sugar that binds to the type 1 pili on E. coli. So you see the E. coli over here and you see sort of these long sort of um, horse tails behind it. That's not it. It's the little tiny, tiny hairs on it. And what it does is it prevents that from sticking to the bladder wall. So it makes it an environment where the bacteria can't stay. Um, in combination with cranberry, those two things together have been helpful in E. coli infections. Um, for other bacteria, the data is questionable, but my, my point to patients is a lot of times it, it could be helpful and it's rarely harmful. Okay, so we, we suggest that patients take this, it's over the counter, um, and it can be enough to reduce bladder infections. Vaginal estrogen, though, is one of the best ways to reduce bladder infections, right? The biggest cause of bladder infection is bacteria from the vagina, and bacteria in the vagina is stabilized with estrogen. So that's why using a small amount can be very helpful. But it could even be the size of a pea that you put on your fingertips and put on your urethra where you pee from at night. That's it. That's a very small amount. And often that is safe. There's no study that shows that amount of estrogen gets into your body in a dangerous way. So again, if chronic bladder infections are there and there's a history of breast cancer, I always ask the patients, let's talk to your oncologist and see if this would be acceptable to them. There are some other things here that we use. Um, we do use something called urogesic blue or methenamine, again, to make the bladder inhospitable to infections. Vitamin C, in theory, can also do that because it acidifies the urine. Sometimes we will use antibiotics prophylactically to reduce infections, but we really try to avoid that because of the rise of resistance. We are in a dangerous situation in this country where a lot of bacteria that are just common for bladder infections are now resistant to the antibiotics. So we try to do every other strategy possible to do this. We also sometimes do a bladder cocktail into the bladder itself. We will put liquid medication in the bladder to help heal the bladder lining and reduce bladder infection. So that's something that we do in the office. The best thing to do, the cheapest thing to do, the safest thing to do is drink water. Right. This was a study that looked at water intake, and the fact was just by getting an adequate amount of water, UTI infections could be reduced by 50%. So when patients, we have tried to streamline our chronic bladder infection patients because we have a lot of them. And, and when they call and say, I think I have a UTI, the nurses have learned to say, you know, how many glasses of water have you had today? I think it's easy to lose track of it. Yes, there's water in coffee, there's water in tea, but your majority of your fluids needs to come from pure water, all right? And so it, if you would just increase your water intake, a lot of times in normal, healthy women, they can get rid of the infection in that way. One thing I will say, though, is get your water during the day. We'll get patients who are getting up all night to drink water, and, and your body really doesn't need the water at night. It needs it during the day, okay? So there's some good news. Water is good for you. Drink it, please. Um, there's also some newer technology available that will allow us to look at the genetic susceptibility of the the actual bacteria causing the infection to different antibiotics. And so that allows us to sometimes create cocktails of antibiotics to treat infections that maybe just seem to be persistent. And this usually requires being sent to a specialized lab where a, a microbiologist is actually taking care of this. So I'm just going to touch on one other touch on one other topic, which is pelvic organ prolapse, um, and this is also an area where estrogen is important, right? Prolapse is a genetic ish, uh, condition, and your your mother may have had it, your grandma, your sister, and maybe they didn't talk about it, but it's it's an inheritable condition. The risk factors for it, though, also are going through menopause, having natural childbirth, chronic cough, weight gain, chronic constipation, um, chronic steroid use, um, again, a lot of different things. But estrogen status is part of that. And as you said, it can be prolapse of the uterus, the vaginal walls. And then the vaginal walls, I mean the wall between the bladder and the vagina, the wall between the rectum and the vagina. 
A lot of times patients come in and that's not their symptom. They will come in saying, I, my, my urinary stream is off. It, it sort of, it comes out and then it stops and then it comes some more. Or I keep feeling like I can't empty my bowels all the way, right? And then if you do a pelvic exam, you will find that there's some prolapse and they may not have been aware of that, but, but that is what's causing the dysfunction in the other organ systems. And that w doesn't appear all of a sudden. It slowly, slowly, slowly comes down. A lot of times after menopause, all of a sudden it will be present. Why? Because our tendons have receptors for estrogen on them as well. So now that tissue is it's at the vaginal opening. Um, we do measurements of those walls, and we measure everything, because if you have prolapse in one wall, you often have it in other walls, right? Uh, we, we know genetically which chromosome the, the risk for prolapse is on, but there's, we can't change that, right? So we're working around that. Um, but it can affect, like I said, urinary and bowel function, but also sexual dysfunction. I will tell you that studies have shown prolapse are not linked to satisfaction with sex, but it can change um, some of the actual dynamics of that, right? And we know that the rise in prolapse is increasing um, just because we're living longer as well, right? We're more active as well. So this is a big area where we will send patients to pelvic floor physical therapy whenever possible. And we will also use estrogen for small, short course, courses if possible as well, because it can strengthen the tissue. It can be helpful if we decide to use a pessary. I'm going to show you some pictures of those. And the estrogen could be helpful if we're going to do a surgery as well. All right. The treatment for prolapse is, is very broad. And again, um, sometimes patients have multiple areas of prolapse. Sometimes they have urinary or bowel incontinence as well. And so as urogynecologists, we treat all of those as, as, as much as we can at the same time. But it's, it's determined by these basic levels. Patient's age can be a factor, but I will tell you that our oldest patient this year was 92 that underwent surgery for prolapse. Now, she had a specific type of procedure, but she was on multivitamins, all right? So she wasn't on anything else. So it's not age alone, it's how our bodies change with age as well, our overall health. Level of physical activity and sexual activity is something that we take into consideration. Um, it's the degree to how bothersome it is. Not it, uh, just because it's there does not mean it has to be treated. So again, a lot of what we do is education, explaining what's going on, and let you, the patient, decide um, what you want to do, all right? Desire for future fertility. In patients who are pregnant and have prolapse, it, it's very common. We suggest that they wait until they've completed their childbearing, but again, very much encouraged going to physical therapy as well, all right? These are some pictures of pessaries. Pessaries have been around for a long, long time. There's some very um, interesting pictures in Egyptian hieroglyphics that show them using pessaries. So this issue is just part of being human. Um, but a really good fitting pessary, a patient's not even aware that it's in place. The idea, though, is that these silicone devices can be put in the vagina to push everything back up where it needs to be to improve your function in a safe, non-surgical way. So um, when we talk to a patient at first, we try to give every option available and just, you know, let you choose. And this definitely is often a safe first treatment option for prolapse, okay? Some of them can be removed by patients. Some of them cannot. They have to be monitored by a physician. Um, some of them can be removed for vaginal intercourse. Some cannot. And some of them are specifically structured for pregnancy as well, all right? Um, surgical treatments, again, are varied. Um, one, one thing that can be available is when a uh, patient's no longer looking for vaginal intercourse anymore, there is a procedure where we can just close the vagina off. That sometimes it sounds a little scary to people, right? But I first say there's all sorts of way to have sexual intercourse, all right? Second, you still urinate from the same place, you still have a bowel mo movement from the same place. But sometimes if a big, long reconstructive surgery is not an option, something like that is available if you also don't want to do a pessary or go to physical therapy, right? And again, we are often doing combined treatment for prolapse 
and urinary incontinence, okay? I decided not to talk about urinary incontinence because it's, it's too broad, but that also is affected by estrogen, and it also has the option of physical therapy, non-surgical treatments, and also surgical treatments for that as well, All right? Well, I hope that wasn't too quick. That's all I have. But uh, this is a picture of me with my children riding off into the sunset in Wyoming. And I hope that you all get the chance today to go out and enjoy the weather. And thank you for waiting to the end for me. I appreciate that.